good to be here with you. I just heard your dear minister say, thanks be to God for this congregation and for all that you do, and I feel inspired already to say the same. Thanks be to God for this family of faith. Families are are places where we love one another, right? Families are made up of people who love one another. Oh, your family. And even, I don't know whether your actual birth family, but your family here. Yeah, your family here. And I'm here as your moderator. You probably have no idea what a moderator is. And most days I'm not too sure either. But I know that I've been elected by the General Council of the United Church of Canada to serve you as your spiritual leader. And uh, so that's what I do, and I get to travel throughout the church to encourage the church, to encourage you, and to listen to you. And so I want to say I'm really grateful that you're part of this great church of ours, and I want to tell you you're part of a bigger family, a bigger church family than you see right now here. You're part of a church family that is worshiping throughout Canada today. And in the fall last year, just about a year ago, I was with some other members of our church family. I'm going to undo that. Well, maybe you can undo that ribbon for me. Whoops. Yeah, and catch it too. That would be good. Thank you. Um, I think it's just one there. And I was with some family, church family members in Alberta. Anybody know where Alberta is? Yeah. It's way out in the what direction? Yes, it's way out west. And I was with some folks in, in, uh, in uh, N- North Saskatchewan. Oh, you know what? It might not be possible to undo it. If it's, if it's too tied up, that's okay. But they, throughout the weekend we were together, they made this collection of pictures that reminded them of our church. And I wondered if any of them reminded you of your church. Oh, great. I think... Yeah, let's maybe pull, let's try pulling that now. You want to pull that and see what happens? Ah, there we are. It's undone. And that little tag I'll, yeah, not want to lose. Do you want to, let's, let's show this, let's show this the other way. You want to hold it up that way? And if you, if you need to come close, thank you, to see what's here. I'm wondering if you can see things that remind you of your church here too and your church family. Anything pop out? You may need to come closer to see. Anything in here that reminds you of your church family? Here? Yeah. The coffee. Oh, there's a cup of coffee. (laughs) Right there. That is something that church families often do, is share in cups of coffee and juice. And I noticed in your church, you use fairly traded coffee. I see. And that means that you're really taking care of the church family even beyond Canada when you use fairly traded coffee. So good for you. Anything else that reminds you of your church? Yeah. Anybody else first? Can you, can you see anything else? Please, go ahead. Sparkly window stickers. The sparkly window stickers, and they look like stained glass windows that are like your lovely stained glass windows. And yes, stained glass windows are something that we often see in our United Church buildings. Anything else you see? Yes. The flowers. The flowers. And you are a family here that takes very good care of your flowers. I've heard that you've won awards for your flower gardens outside. Yeah, so, and so you, your beauty, the beauty that you care for, the beauty of the earth you care for, that's something that we share in our United Church throughout Canada, is wanting to take good care of the beauty of God's earth. Um, the shoes on there... Um, to donate to the church for the food bank and the people who need it. Thank you. Yes, there's a pair of running shoes there. And you heard that. That um, This is another conviction of the people of the United Church of Canada, that we care for everyone in our community. Yes. I see people. 
people. Those people. And, and here too? Yeah, people. Yeah. There are all kinds of people here, and we are a church of all kinds of people. All colors, all ages, all types, all, um, all different <laughs> looks. We are a church of variety, and in fact, our church, we call our church an intercultural church because we want to be the kind of church where people of varied cultures get to know one another better. And this is something your church does, too, even with your community and all your different faith communities that you become family with in common projects. Do you see this here? Is that something you've ever seen around your church? No? You... You may see it here and there. I, I pointed to the crest of the United Church of Canada. And like any family, we have symbols and things that remind us of who we are together. And this is a crest that we, uh, we often place in, in, uh, in our hymn books and in our, in our buildings in different places. I wear it. I wear this stole as moderator. I also wear this stole in our new season of creation in the church. And this is a brand new symbol to the United Church of Canada that's uh, on the other side here, which has all kinds of things in it. What do you see? Um, It's it's not on this one, but on the other one. I can tell what each one means. You can tell. tell Actually, I think only one. This means fire. It does. It reminds us of the burning bush. And it also reminds us of the Presbyterian Church, which was one of the churches that came into the, being the United Church of Canada 86 years ago. Mm-hmm. So, you, yes, that's a very important symbol. These are symbols we share, biblical and church, and these symbols of all God's creation, water, earth, sky. Well, thank you for telling me a little bit about the things that you see here in your church family that are common to our whole United Church of Canada family. And today we give thanks that we are a church family, that God loves us, and that God gives us the capacity in this church community to love the whole world, everybody in every part of earth. Good morning. The first reading today is from Deuteronomy 30, verses 11 to 19. It's when Moses calls the people to choose between good and evil and life and death. Now, what what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven so that you have to ask, who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it? Nor is it beyond the sea, so that you have to ask, Who will cross the sea to get it, and proclaim it to us, so that we may obey it? No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth, and in your heart, so that you may obey it. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord, your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. And the second reading is from the Gospel of Matthew 12, verses 38 to 40, when Jesus responds to the request for a miracle. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a miraculous sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign, 
but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. May God bless our understanding of these words. I found myself so engrossed in those scripture passages, I almost forgot it was my time to step up. It is such a joy to be with you this morning. I know there are good reasons not to applaud after an anthem like that, but I'm in a congregation that always applauds, and I had to really hold myself back from that amazing, amazing music. And just, um, and just the spirit that I see and read about in this place. Um, and that I'm experiencing in this moment. I give God thanks and praise. Will you pray with me, please? May every thought that tugs for our attention be brought into your light. May we allow you to guide our listening and speaking so that all that we are is connected to our being in you, and all that we do radiates your love. Amen. I'm going to ask you to provide the visuals for this uh, first part of the sermon. I'm going to ask you to imagine a clearing that is important or meaningful to you, a clearing in a wood, a clearing by a river perhaps, or a, or a creek or a lake, and to listen to these words from the poet Wendell Berry. The clearing rests in song and shade. It is a creature made by old light held in soil and leaf by human joy and grief, by human work, fidelity of sight and stroke, by rain, by water on the parent stone. We join our work to heaven's gift, our hope to what is left that field and wood at last agree in an economy of widest worth. High heaven's kingdom come on earth. Imagine paradise. O dust, arise. So let me tell you about the clearing to which this poem takes me but don't let go of the clearing to which it has taken you. It takes me to a clearing at the back of our 100-acre farm when I was a child. My mom contracted tuberculosis when I was very, very little, and so she needed to come to Toronto to be in a sanatorium um, when my younger brother and I were small, and we lived with my grandparents, my maternal grandparents, until she recovered. It wasn't an easy time for our family. But the moment I recall with that poem is the time in the clearing after her return back home. It was a moment of bliss. It was a day when we walked along the fenced lane, carrying our picnic all the way back to the creek where we sat by the water in the clearing. And all along the way, Mom identified the birds, the, song, the songs of the birds, the bobolinks, the meadowlarks, the bluebirds, the orioles. What a deep sense of heaven's gift on my grandparents' farm. Many decades, or many years later, um, I think it was about a decade ago, I walked to where that clearing used to be. The property has changed hands several times, 
and water no longer flows in that creek bed. No birds sing. The land has been developed and dried up like so many places on the planet. And I felt as if I'd lost my bearings and as if my soul was drying up with the creek. Many of us today have this sense of dislocation and loss. At this year's International Film Festival here in Toronto, Joanna Schneller pointed out in the Globe and Mail that there was a trend toward films that were describing the tensions and upheavals of mass migration. Nobody lives where their grandparents are from anymore said Joan Schott, who's one of TIFF's programmers. She goes on to say, the impact is felt on societies, cultures, and families at every level. Now, my aunt still lives on a little piece of my grandparents' farm, and she still manages, probably not for much longer. It broke my heart that last week was the first week I can ever remember that she couldn't get out to her gardens. And her kitchen garden is um, bigger than most suburban lots. Her home was, has welcomed many generations of family, guard, uh, family gatherings. And when I heard her recently wondering aloud what would happen to the property when she was gone, my heart sank. I wished, as I'm sure my siblings did, that we could think of some way to continue to care for that land within our family, to care for it as she has, to keep it as a center for family gatherings and to pass it on to future generations. But I can't see any way to make that happen, and the truth is, those days are gone. We can't go back, and there is no usefulness in harboring a sense of nostalgia for the past. When I am confronted by the prospect of such sweeping and sometimes devastating change, I take my soul to poetry and to scripture and to prayer and to community. So Wendell Berry's poetry gives me some solace and challenge. We join our work to heaven's gift, our hope to what is left. In other words, we have nowhere to go but forward. Whatever catastrophic changes have occurred, humanity cannot go back. Instead, we join our work to heaven's gift and our hope to what is left. For us, the gospel is one of heaven's gifts and one of the places where our souls find a way forward, find healing. So we turn this morning to the scripture we heard, particularly from Matthew, and I know that it was confusing to everyone that I chose this passage, because it is not one you've seen or heard me write about before, um, and frankly, it's not one I've ever preached on in this with this theme. I became aware this week that it is a passage being used by Christians around the world within this new liturgical season of creation with, in which we now share. So I thought, well, let's join with them. So you remember, then some scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign. No sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so these three days and these so for three days and three nights, the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. These are symbols of surrender and rebirth. Jonah and Jesus each surrender themselves, not without a struggle, but surrender themselves to God's will and are reborn. When Jesus says, for three days the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth, there's an obvious reference to the time that Jesus spends in the tomb. I'm indebted to Ched Myers, who's a remarkable biblical scholar, for an additional insight into this passage. He points out how important place 
and land were to Jesus. There's so many. And in fact, he says to that the scribes and Pharisees were being told by Jesus, you haven't paid attention yet? You don't, you, you don't already see? You need another sign? How much I love the earth, the place? He notes that Jesus communicated, Ched notes that Jesus communicated with illiterate peasants with those images of land, through stories about the land. His seed parables envision the kingdom of God, not as some otherworldly place and time, but as the reclamation of the very soil upon which these peasants toil. And in the context, in this context, this passage can also be read as if Jesus is the seed that disappears deep into the earth only to rise again. And that's an image, by the way, that Paul uses for resurrection, the seed image in Corinthians too. Jesus is reborn from the heart of the earth. In life and in death, Jesus is tied to earth and tied to peoples of earth. He challenges a civilization which was, does not live with respect in creation, who does not live with respect for soul, for community, and for all of creation. And this shouldn't surprise us, for God so loved the world. Jesus' rebirth from the heart of earth is a symbol of reconciliation, between God and God's creation. Wendell Berry put it this way, that field and wood at last agree in an economy of widest worth. The field, I think, represents human activity. It's we who plow the seeds and scatter, or plow the fields and scatter the good seed on the land, right? The wood represents God's creation the natural order. When field and wood agree in an economy of widest worth, then we will at last have come to the waiting reconciliation which God established through Jesus. We're not there yet. We inhabit an economy of narrow worth in which a tree has value only once it's knocked down. In an economy of narrow worth, no woods will be left. Imagine paradise, says Barry. We can't get to that economy of widest worth without first imagining it and caring enough, caring enough to do something inspired by that vision. So he then says, O oh, dust, arise. You see, this is a dynamic relationship of loving and caring for earth not unlike any of our other relationships, which we imagine could be better, and in that imagining are propelled to invest the time, the effort, time and again, even after every setback and pain. So what's our way forward from here? How do we, in this place, join our work to heaven's gift, our hope to what is left? The question we face as a species is how to care for the planet. But perhaps a better starting place for each of us is how to care for the neighborhood in which we live, for each small piece and parcel of land, each one of which is preciously different from every other. There is so much we can do to make these relationships better. I'm seeing it here, actually, in the way in which your bread ba- food basket program, my goodness, and the cultivation of food here right on this land that you've negotiated to use for good, God's good, widest economy. There, so you're already doing things that make the relationship better. And it may or may not have anything to do with the place where our grandparents lived, Frankly, I can't imagine how I can play a direct part in loving that farm, cl- that farm clearing I recall back to health. But I can plant vegetables, as you are. I can make an effort to know my neighbors and restore in the urban place where I now live some sense of community. 
the kind of community that my parents and grandparents knew. I can pay attention to political systems and attempt to give my support to leaders who value an economy of widest worth, again, what you're doing in this election time. I can bring all these questions and hopes into worship as we are doing now, here in this place and in concert with Christians around the world during this season, this season of creation. We can draw inspiration from many sources. Um, Doug and I got to see a film at the film festival called Last Call at the Oasis. Anyone else see it? I went prepared to be depressed because it's about the global crisis coming, really coming, tremendous crisis in relation to water. But it tells, for instance, the story of the Middle East chapter of Friends of the Earth, where Israelis, Palestinians, and Jordanians are working together to restore the Jordan River, where Jesus was baptized. These folks are inspiring. I was also inspired to learn about the Michigan farm woman who spent 20 years gathering local water samples over the taunts and threats of her neighbors to prove that the diseases affecting her community have been caused by industrial pollution. It was a lovely scene in which she was honored at the White House and President Obama kissed her on the cheek. Closer to home, there are more inspiring stories. Yes, here, but let me tell you, for instance, about another congregation that I was with this summer in Eden Mills, um, Ontario. They have decided to become North America's first carbon neutral community. And church people of the United Church community are giving leadership to this. With great delight, following worship and the meal on Sunday, they walked me around the community, showing me all they've done and have imagined to do for the, in their homes, uh, for their, in the, with their buildings, their streets, their walkways. In their first year, they've reduced their carbon footprint by 13%. And they've inspired many other communities, including the Junction here in Toronto and Riverdale, to take on a similar goal. Charles Simon is a member of that community, and he explains that you just have to keep going. You have to hold true to your vision. And it's all about how you keep the enthusiasm up. He says, we have meals together and concerts, and they become fundraisers to help us do what more we want to do. And there is no finger-pointing or preaching, because that doesn't help anybody. The community of Eden Mills is grateful that they're a part of a national church that speaks on their behalf, but they're not going to wait for anyone else to do their work for an economy of widest worth. All these people on the banks of the Jordan, on this Michigan farm, just up the road a bit in Eden Mills and here, all are living lives as imaginative seeds planted today for the sake of life tomorrow, fulfilling the promise of Isaiah, the surviving remnant of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. They, we take action where we are because it's only love for a particular place and a particular relationship with the place that can motivate us to struggle as we must on behalf of all places. How do you and I then join our work to heaven's gift? How are we taking root in our particular place and for the sake of every place? Well, we answer. We answer with both our little decisions and our big decisions every day. And with the inspiration that comes of our prayers. And so, again, with the words of Wendell Berry, prayers, prayerful words to close. Teach me work that honors thy work, the true economies of goods and words, to make my arts compatible, compatible with the songs of local birds. Imagine paradise, my friends. O oh, dust, arise. Amen.